Okay, good morning and welcome. Uh, so today we are starting our third module, module 3A, um, and we're moving into a really exciting portion of the class learning. This is uh, the, the section of our learning where we transition from primarily focusing on our writing skills. So up until now we've been working on uh, first building our knowledge of grammar, uh, then looking at sentences, and then we've moved into paragraphs. So we will continue to develop our paragraph writing skills. Um, but today we kind of shift the focus. So uh, all of that was looking at your productive skills, your writing skills. Now we're going to be looking at your reading skills and we're going to be using the components you've built in your writing toolkit. Sometimes I'll refer to your your writer's tool belt or your writer's tools or tool chest. Um, those are some metaphors that I use to talk about the skills that we're building. Um, but today we, we kind of flip the coin over um, and we start looking at how to read and then use what we know about writing to talk about the pieces that we're reading. So today's mini lecture is going to be looking at the elements of the short story. Um, and so we're hoping that you're going to be taking notes here as the uh, second uh, the second title or the underscore title indicates. And um, then you should be looking at making focus questions for yourself. So what questions come up from this presentation? Do you see any gaps or holes in the knowledge? Do you have any kind of analytical um, queries about the topic? And you can um, address those to me in your uh, homework assignment. Okay, so let's start on level one, the basics. So obviously when we're looking at short stories, uh, one of the most important elements of a short story are the characters that the writer chooses to write about. There's one thing you have to know about writing and about short story writing is that um, because short stories are short, the writers have to be economical about what they put into their story. So everything is done on purpose. Um, so the characters are chosen for a very specific reason. So we want you to look carefully at the characters and think about why the author has chosen to include those specific types of characters in their story. So number two, the second um, core element is the setting. Where does the story take place? Um, and you have to think about the context of, of, the, of, of this choice. So not just where, but when and why has the author selected that time period, that place? Are there other historical events, events connected to that place during that time that might have a relevance to the story? So again, everything is done for a reason. Number three, um, we're always hoping that students can figure out or tease out the main themes of a story. Um, so what does the author want us to learn or want us to think about? Um, it should kind of jump out, jump out, jump out at you, um, and we'll see this as we get into uh, our short stories this week. Um, okay, so here's the next concept. We talk about foils, uh, which are usually characters or forces within the story that kind of meet and match each other in opposition. So, you know, if you're a fan of the Batman comic series, you know that there are uh, several classic foils. Um, that Batman might face, right, in any given story. You've got the Joker, you've got Penguin, you've got Two-Face, you know, the, the, the list goes on and on, the Killer Croc, you know, um, and, and, and usually these characters are almost like a dark side of the hero, right, or they represent an opposing force of the hero. Um, this could also be natural forces, um, in, in the story, The Call of the Wild, obviously, uh, where, where you're talking about trying to survive against harsh elements in, in the far north, um, the actual environment can become a foil to the characters. Okay, so um, this is kind of related to the foil piece here, which is conflicts. Now, conflicts are essential to every story because they drive the story forward. Now, um, this lecture on elements that are found in stories, it's actually, you could call it a lecture on uh, liter literary devices or literary elements because we find these in all different types of uh, literature and actually also in TV shows and movies and stuff. And I would even say that TVs and movies are almost like a new version of, of classic written stories. Um, so we see conflicts in, in 
TVs and movies as well. Um, and conflicts are essential for driving the story forward. But one thing that's a little bit unique about short stories is because because they're uh, shrunk, because they're a snapshot, because their length and content is 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 kind of abbreviated. There won't be as many conflicts uh, in a short story as there will be in a, in a novel, obviously. So when you're looking at the conflicts we find in the short story, you really you really kind of have to be like, okay, what does this mean, right? Why why was this moment selected? Why was this conflict selected? So again, we're always trying to analyze the choices of the author. Um, good. And finally, we also talk about the climax, and this is going to be the the, the moment where the main uh, competition is resolved, or where the where the main kind of tension in the story is resolved. You know, this is the moment where the good guy fights the bad guy on top of the mountain, kind of thing. And you're gonna, you know, this all of the all of the uh, story has been leading up to this point. And then afterwards, you've also got uh, traditionally something called the resolution, um, and this is this is where all of the kind of um, un unfixed ends or the loose ends get tied off, right? Okay, so second, we're going to talk about uh, our level two uh, story elements, or what I sometimes call the advanced devices, and I also might refer to them as writer's tools um, because they're they're things that we need to really kind of keep our eyes out for and they are um, usually set up in a in a little bit of a traditional way um, and so they're they're a little bit more advanced and therefore we kind of we kind of have to keep our eyes open so the first one is irony um, um, irony is, is commonly used in in stories short stories novels in TV shows again in movies it's it's one of these really common devices but it's 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 a little bit uh, more difficult to tease, tease out because it's when the opposite happens to what's expected. So this could also be kind of, it's kind of aligned with these, this new idea of there's got to be a twist in the plot. So things might be moving along um, and then they're going to bring an unexpected character in as the villain or something like that. It might even be an ironic choice, like where, you know, it was the brother of the main character. And that's a little bit of an irony, right? Because you're thinking family should be on your side, right? But it could be set there on purpose. Okay, so irony is something we need to keep in our crosshairs as uh, readers. Next, we have foreshadowing. So foreshadowing is commonly used to kind of sprinkle in some breadcrumbs uh, to help us predict what's going to happen, right? Um, and these are subtle hints of what is to come. So if you think of a classic example um, in The Lord of the Rings, the, the trilogy of books and movies, at the very beginning of the, of the first book, we see Bilbo and Gandalf have this moment of conflict where Bilbo has a really hard time letting go of the ring, the one ring, his, his magic ring. Um, and actually, he kind of flips out, right? And he, he actually turns almost evil in that moment. This is foreshadowing the ultimate climax of the book where Frodo cannot let go of the ring. And in fact, at the very end, Smeagol or Gollum has to bite the, f the finger off. Uh, Frodo doesn't have the willpower to let go of the ring. So we see that that was foreshadowed, the idea that the ring is an overpoweringly evil force and eventually, ironically, ends up uh, out... Uh, outsmarting itself because the the greed that two different characters feel for it end up causing the undoing of this great power, right? So that's an example where foreshadowing is used to set up this conflict that's going to happen at the end. And then there's an ironic kind of resolution because uh, evil undoes evil, right? Okay, so the next uh, advanced device is metaphor. Uh, metaphor is a direct comparison. So we have a couple of different types of comparisons that we use as writers to help readers understand our characters uh, more deeply. Um, metaphor is a direct comparison. So this is when we use uh, one thing directly compared to another thing. And we usually use the verb to be to set this up, right? So she's a lioness. Is the character actually a lioness? Well, she could be, but maybe she's just a really strong and powerful person who, you know, exudes this charisma, and we're trying to draw that into the character through a comparison. We use a direct comparison, okay? Second type is simile. So a simile is an indirect comparison where we use like or as to set up the comparison. So again, here's our example. He's as sharp, or he's sharp as a dagger. Uh, this is indirect because we use the word as. 
Okay, finally, we also, uh, there's a few more here for our level two devices. The next one is these uh, classic imagery passages or descriptive passages. Um, and these are scenes that are written where we're trying to capture a moment uh, in, in words. Um, the Lord of the Rings has, has so many of these passages, um, but you'll kind of know this because the, the writer is taking time to try to carefully describe the detail um, and we would call this an imagery passage or a descriptive passage. And finally, uh, symbolism. So symbolism is somewhat related to metaphor and simile because something is standing for something else. But when we're looking at symbolism, uh, it might have a larger cultural meaning or connection. It might have um, a mythological connection, um, but also symbols tend to have a larger place in the story. So there's something that is like going to be carried throughout an entire story where that symbolic meaning is powerful to the unfolding of the story. Whereas a metaphor and a simile is kind of like a snapshot. It's just a moment where we're trying to give a clearer description of a character. So those are the level one and level two devices, the basics and the advanced. Now let's look at some analytical questions that can help us kind of pierce deeper into the heart of stories. So when we're moving through analytical analysis, um, we want to, and in particular literary analysis, we want to have some kind of stock guiding questions that we use to help us kind of unpack the stories themselves. So you got to put these on your all of the things that we have today. So you, for from today's mini lecture, you should be making at least three um, study cards to add into your study deck. And for these these questions, you might want each one to be on its own card. Um, so question one, what major changes happen in the characters throughout the story? So again, characters are important. They drive the stories. They're the vehicles of conflict. And they're also the vehicles of the author's lesson. So we need to really carefully observe what happens to the characters. And so then we might ask ourselves as a follow-on question, what causes these changes? Okay, and, and we, you might even say, what do these changes mean? Okay, so question two, uh, what critical themes are present in the story? What evidence do you have to support your findings? So you'll notice that quite often I'm going to ask you to support your findings. That means can you prove through an example that what you're saying is true? So if you were saying that in The Lord of the Rings, friendship is one of the main themes, um, friendship helping us through difficult times. Yes, okay, 100%. How would you prove it? Then you would go through and find all those moments, those beautiful moments where Frodo and Sam are struggling on their own to get to Mordor, and you could use the passages to actually kind of give definite proof that, you know, this is one of the major themes. So um, when we read as readers, when you're reading a passage and you're like, huh, that, that, that section there seems to kind of be a perfect example of one of the themes, then you might want to put a star beside it and make a note in your margin. This is an evidence piece to prove a major theme. So when you're reading, you should be active and you should be using guiding questions to help you. And you should be trying to find examples of the literary devices, right? Oh, that's the setting. Oh, here's a list of my characters. And you want to make notes right on the document. And that's why I recommend printing off our short stories if you can and going through them and making notes almost um, like you're doing Cornell notes as you're reading. So taking notes of all the things you notice right there on the story. Okay, question three, what are the major, can you analyze the major conflicts in the story? Why do they happen? What do they possibly represent? So again, we're, we're not just asking a single question. We're kind of trying to tease out deeper meaning here. And question four, which literary devices are shown in the story? And again, I'm always going to ask you to provide examples. Okay, so um, as I said, this is a big week for us. We're moving into short stories. I'm going to be asking you to do a lot of reading, a lot of thinking, a lot of taking notes, and then we'll be looking at how to build an analysis paragraph using our evidence. So this week, we're also going to introduce our APA methodologies. Okay, welcome. Week three, let's do it.